Well, this is being recorded to the cloud and it is September 26th and at Indiana University, can you believe it? We are in week 20, oh, no, week six, <laughs> not 26, God, my God. Uh, and, you know, it's flying by. It's already cooling off here. The summer heat was just torturous for several months, you know, just as that is in Georgia with Tom and in Houston with, with uh, Sarah. Uh, now it's delightful to be here. I wish you all could join me and we could have class face to face live, but being that powers that be don't want that to happen yet, we're going to have a virtual chat session with Tom Reeves from Georgia and hopefully his colleague, Ron Oliver from Edith Cowan University in Western Australia in Perth. Um, and they've teamed up many times for articles and for books. And in the class R511, we actually have an article of, of Ron's this week, uh, Authentic E-Learning in Higher Ed, Design Principles for Authentic Learning Environments and Tasks with the, both their colleagues, Jan Harrington. Tom uh, Reeves is on a book with them with almost the same title. So he knows the topic extremely well. And next week, we have an article from Tom with his wife, Trisha Reeves, on learning theories. And so um, I, I hope that Tom can discuss learning theories with us a bit. And in week 11, we have an uh, article from Tom and myself on MOOCs and something Mena knows a fair bit about herself. So I have three different pieces that we can comment on today, Tom. But I think uh, we should start uh, with this topic of authentic e-learning, e-learning itself. Um, and, and maybe a history that you're cleaning your office of 40 years, is it? 39. Yeah. So that's not an easy thing to do at all, uh, but a fun thing, you know, it, it can be. So, um, you know, online learning is something you were in back in the 90s before most people were, were exploring that. And you were an early researcher in the field and I know that because I met you at a at the media conference where we discussed it in 1999. Uh, and so you're, you're, you also published in, on authentic e-learning and moving away from shovelware in the early 2000s. And that's 20 years ago. Has thing, have things changed in the online learning or e-learning space to, uh, and, oh, let me back up a second. Before I ask that question, Tom, you want to give us a little background that, that might flavor the moment uh, for those that don't know you? Sure, absolutely. Uh, certainly one of the pivotal events of my life was in uh, 1993, I got seconded, <laughs> a word I had not heard before, uh, by the Western, uh, uh, the Ministry of Education in Western Australia to go there for five months and do an evaluation working with Ron Oliver of, of English as a second language. Um, uh, they called it LOT, languages other than English, because uh, they also taught Japanese and so forth. So Ron and I got to travel around remote areas of Australia uh, evaluating this program that was being used in remote mining towns and was also being used in Aboriginal villages. I mean, we went to some very, very remote areas and uh, really got to uh, love Ron. He's such a great guy. And he had a doctoral student at the time, Jan Harrington, who was beginning to build a theory of authentic learning. She was an instructional designer at uh, Edith Cowan University. And so she and Ron invited me to be part of her doctoral committee. Can I share my screen? Yeah. I'll okay. make you a, I'll make you a okay. host. If you, it looks if you, like I might already be. Okay. Um, I think you can. Okay. Let's try that. Okay. So um, can you see my slide here? Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you see uh, Jan Harrington there on the left and Ron Oliver on the right. And so we ended up writing a book together, A Guide to Authentic E-Learning. It actually won a uh, Best Book Award at ACT a few years ago. Jan's dissertation ended up getting the Dissertation of the Year Award um, for um, 
doctoral students at AECT. But, uh, oops, wrong way. So the model that uh, uh, Jan came up with and that we fleshed out basically says that these are the critical components of an authentic learning environment. You have to have an authentic context, uh, authentic task. You know, one of the, uh, I remember early on when uh, people were beginning to use the web for uh, the courses and faculty would come to me and say, uh, well, I wanna have a website uh, for my course. And I said, well, that sounds good. What uh, are your students gonna do in your course? And they said, well, I wanna have a website with, there's 150 links to geology out there on the web. I want all those on my course. I said, well, that sounds good. What is it your students are gonna learn to do in your course? And I really struggled to get the faculty to tell me what is it they, you know, they're gonna do. Well, they're gonna read a textbook, they're gonna write papers, they're gonna take exams. Very, very traditional pedagogy. So we argued that you, know, you have to have an authentic context, authentic task is probably the most important thing. What are the students going to do? Uh, and then, uh, you model for them through expert performances. You provide opportunities for multiple roles and perspectives on that task. Uh, collaboration is a critical, important part of authentic learning. So people collaborate together to create a solution to a problem or um, create some sort of artifact that represents or represents their knowledge. Then you get them to engage in reflection and articulation. You as a teacher, rather than being a strict didactic teacher, you're providing coaching and scaffolding. And then the assessment is really built right into the task because uh, the task is, is so critical. So, uh, you know, in Jan's case, for her dissertation, she wanted students to learn about uh, different ways of doing assessment within mathematics education. And what uh, the way it was set up, she used the CD-ROM, which Apple actually later bought her CD-ROM and included it when they sold Macintoshes, which was really great. But in this CD-ROM, uh, pre-service teachers were, were given real world tasks in a real world context. So they were in a school and the principal writes them a memo and says, uh, Julie's mother called and she, uh, Julie's mother, uh, Julie is so upset, so stressed out, she can't uh, uh, take the test that you've scheduled for this Friday. She's just in tears, she's terrified. Can you provide an, al uh, an alternative means of assessing her knowledge in mathematics? And so that then sends the, the pre-service teacher into a whole lot of resources and so forth to come up with an alternative assessment strategy for Julie. And there were all kinds of real world tasks, real world problems like that, that was all done in those days through an interactive, uh, uh, it was a CD-ROM, interactive CD is what it was. Anyway, um, so that's kind of the overview of the authentic learning model. And we've applied it now in lots and lots of different contexts. So for example, <clears throat> uh, Sarah uh, McNeil introduced me to some wonderful folks at Baylor College of Medicine. And when the pandemic started, suddenly their first year doctoral students could not get on campus, could not take face-to-face -face classes. So how do you uh, afford them the opportunity to learn an authentic task? So working with some of the wonderful people there, we set up a course where first year medical students worked in teams to come up with a solution, a proposal for a real product that would allow medical students to get hands-on experience with patients in a virtual space. And so over the period of the course, they met in teams. Each team was mentored by a real physician and they came up with proposals for various products, uh, various ideas, programs, uh, that would solve this problem of how do you provide hands-on experience with patients in an online environment. At the end of the course, we had kind of a shark tank event and each team presented 
their ideas and how they would solve this and, and so forth. And so it was an authentic task online for first year medical students. And that was just uh, last year. So it continues to, this model continues to reverberate and be used in lots of different contexts. It's really cool when one can see one's work continue on and be used <clears throat> um, beyond the initial you know, project or grant. Because too often grants, you know, uh, money, money falls out and you know, dissipates and the, the project goes away and you never hear from it again. So to keep working on it today, for a project that started in the 1990s is pretty fascinating actually it's a good it's a tra it's a trail you know all research is a trail and it builds on and so in 2006 tom did a little chapter in my handbook of blended learning that is titled learning Authent creating authentic learning environments through blended learning approaches by ron oliver jan harrington and tom reeves in there you discuss an authentic situation involving research could you explain do you remember what that one was because there's many examples and by the way the authentic learning book is free it's now available as a pdf did you know that tom i did not so it's a pdf i found it after i send out the invite to most people but i think sharonica i think i sent you the full book i think i sent it yes. to me um and i the sharonica could you share that link i sent you in the chat so everyone could download okay. that free book. Um, okay, I will. I will. Thank you. There's a couple links. One is the main link, and then one's a PDF link. Um, so I, it's through Melbourne, I think, or some institute. It's, it's in an OER repository. So it's, it's a 2010 book, and, and I think they post on there how many downloads per month, uh, and it's pretty impressive. So uh, congrats, Tom. You got. I, I announced something you didn't even know today. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's and it, it is interesting uh, that uh, quite a, a few people, uh, and I don't even know if the book's still in print. Uh, frankly, I uh, was searching my shelves this morning, and maybe I've already packed it away, but I cannot find my copy of the book. So, I only had one copy left. Um, I bought a copy and then you sent me a signed copy and I searched last night on my shelves endlessly for, I think my students grabbed them uh, and hopefully it's in my current class. I'm going to get them back at the end of the semester because I bring them all to all my books in. So that's what I'm, I'm thinking happened. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I'm feeling a little better that you also searched your shelves and couldn't find it. It's your yeah. book. <laughs> so do you remember that example of a researcher? Because we have people here who might find that interesting, you know, how, how to do authentic uh, research methods class. Yeah, uh, well, uh, I'm, I'm struggling to remember exactly which one that was, but uh, for example, uh, as you probably know, uh, I've also been involved with design-based research and really promote that as um, an important way to approach research in the field. Um, and uh, had another book uh, written with Susan McKinney. In fact, we are now in our second edition. And um, the, uh, by the way, I uh, hate to announce bad news, but Cheered Plump uh, passed away just mm -hmm. recently. And he was also a major, major figure in design-based research uh, and co-edited a couple of books about that. And uh, just a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, I uh, had dinner with him ag again, uh, probably about four years ago, and I knew his health was failing. So it was really sad to hear that he had passed away this month. He's from the uh, Netherlands, if people don't, aren't familiar with his name, and uh, University of Twente? Yeah, University of Twente. And he worked a lot with Don Ely uh, at Syracuse. And Syracuse and Twente had a really close relationship for decades. I'm not sure if that's still in existence, but... Anyway, um, so I, I, I'm trying to remember now, but I suspect it was we uh, in the in those days, design based research was fairly new. And so my, what I had my class do was actually develop an electronic performance support system an EPSS for design based research. So the class throughout the 16 weeks of the course, we built an online resource that included readings 
and uh, tools and so forth. Probably the neatest thing about it though was we went to AERA, took a whole bunch of students to AERA and they went around and video interviewed all the top scholars in design-based research, people like Alan Collins and, mm -hmm. and uh, so forth. And so the website ended up having all these uh, interviews with the people who had really been pioneers in design-based research. So the whole task was to build a much needed resource about design-based research. You might recognize the name Alan Collins from the article in a couple of weeks on situated learning. We're going to call Brown, Collins, and Degude. You'll see that maybe it is, maybe it's next week in, in my class. So uh, names you, that Tom puts out here, you'll find in the, in the syllabus you'll find in your reading somewhere because uh, Tom's worked with many, many such folks. Uh, so the design principles you've gone through, I was, that was the first question I was going to ask you because that's the title of the article, Design Principles for Authentic Learning environments and tasks. Uh, and you've given a couple examples of what that would entail. Do you have any more examples that you might, you've just given another one, but. Uh, sure. Well, probably the best known one, and I'm gonna share my screen again here, um, is um, the one we did with the World Health Organization. So uh, I'm gonna um, get back here. So I've worked with the World Health Organization for quite a few years, and uh, particularly with a physician in Geneva named Umit Kartuglu, and uh, Jim Vesper, who uh, uh, was one of my PhD students. I actually co-chaired his dissertation with Jan Harrington, and Hannah Terrace, who uh, was at Murdoch University in Perth at the time. She's now back in Finland. Uh, her home country. Uh, I, I had her husband in Silver Lining for Learning a few months ago. So. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> Marco. Yeah, yeah. Um, but uh, for years, in order to learn about how to manage vaccines in developing countries, um, the World Health Organization would bring. Uh, people from around the world to Turkey because Turkey has a particularly good um, vaccine management system. And with vaccines, you have a problem of cold chain. And what that means basically is vaccines have to be kept at a fairly narrow temperature range, usually between uh, uh, two and six um, degrees centigrade. And you, uh, if you've gotten the COVID vaccine, you know uh, the challenges, for example, with the Pfizer was that it really has to be very, very cold. Anyway, so it's, uh, uh, they would put these people, 15 people on a bus, and they would split them up into teams of three people. And we traveled down, and I actually went on this course, the bus, the famous bus course. And uh, um, we would travel down the, the uh basically the cold chain management trail uh, and visit vaccine warehouses, hospitals, provincial vaccine stores, family health centers, um, and uh, retail pharmacies and so forth. Everywhere vaccines are stored and, and used and so forth. And uh, I'm gonna skip that. But I was meeting with him when he invited me over to Geneva to give a talk. And I, I just kind of casually said, you know, that course is great, but you can only do 15 people a year. It's so expensive to put people on a bus and travel around the country. I think we could put that bus course online. And at first he was uh, a little skeptical and I gave him a copy of, of uh, this book. And the next time I saw Umit, he that book is, I've never seen a book so well read. I mean, he had underlined everything, pages, had uh, probably a hundred sticky notes in it, all this kind of stuff. So we set about the task of trying to build this course online. So we had authentic context and task. Uh, so for example, um, a uh, deciding whether a vaccine has been frozen or not, or uh, a realistic role, it might be, you've got to get these vaccines to this remote mountaintop and uh, your refrigerated truck has broken down, how are you gonna transport these vaccines there? 
in a safe manner. So authentic context and task, uh, they would play different roles. Um, in, and again, we on the online version of this, we had them work in teams, three person teams. Uh, they, uh, they also worked, it was a, tw we took a one week face to face on a bus course and put it into a 12 week online course. And, but the last five weeks of the course, they actually provided consultation with other countries to help them improve their cold chain management system. We had access to expert performances. So we recorded videos with experts all over the world about how to uh, manage the cold chain. Um, and uh, again, we had them you know, play different roles at different times in the course maybe a pharmacist, maybe a physician, maybe a cold store manager, et cetera. Uh, and then uh, this was a, a typical online version of the course where um, we, people came from all different countries. I mean, here you see people from India, from Russia, from Ghana uh, and so forth. And they would be mentored online uh, in this course. So here's, we split them up into teams. Here's a typical team, three person team. You got a woman from Nigeria, a man from Sri Lanka and another man from Micronesia. And they would work throughout the 12 weeks together to accomplish these authentic tasks and learn in the process. We had them engage in reflection, do diaries and so forth. Uh, they had to um, articulate their knowledge in different ways. Uh, and uh, we use lots of different tools for that. Uh, we provided- I see using Flipgrid there. <laughs> yeah, we use Flipgrid. Uh, I had uh, met, uh, I, well, I knew Charlie Miller already and I was at a, a conference and I said, Charlie, I'm working with the World Health Organization and I think Flipgrid could have a role in this course. And he said, no problem, you can use it. So we did. And you know, Flipgrid initially was, uh, in, developed for kids, but it's really taken off for adults too. There's a little pilot project of Charlie's that it's now been, as you know, uh, but most people here don't know, it's been bought out by Microsoft and is free as part of the Microsoft package and, and downloaded by a teacher every 10 seconds or so uh, and exploded during the pandemic, the use of, of Flipgrid. So there's all sorts of add-ons and, and different social media tools uh, that make Flipgrid almost a complete platform, if you will. So uh, yeah, it's. Charlie, who Charlie Miller was a professor at Minnesota, but he no longer is. Uh, and he's a good friend of Tom and mine. And it's great to see someone do something and just, it, it changes the world. I mean, really um, it has, so. Yeah, it's a great tool. So we provided coaching and scaffolding and uh, lots of feedback was a big part of the course. Uh, and then the assessment, again, was built right into the course. So they actually worked for, uh, say, Albania. The Albania Ministry of Health would say, well, here are the challenges we're facing in Albania. And the students would collaborate and come up with uh, ideas for how to improve the cold chain management of vaccines in Albania over the last five weeks of the course. Um, and uh, the course... Um, kind of look like this uh, and uh, so that you see that the center part of the screen there uh, has the task and so forth resources along the bottom and then the the trip is represented in the uh, uh, right hand column where they visit these different facilities the hospitals the pharmacies and and uh, so forth um, and the role of technology, rather than using it as something you learn from, we use it as something you learn with. We used it as cognitive tools. And that's been another theme of my research over the years. I wrote a paper, my most cited paper was one I wrote with David Jonathan um, that uh, is about learning with technology as opposed to learning from technology. I was just going to say, David Jonathan and Tom Reeves is the, the awardee of the 2013 David Jonathan Award at AACT. And, um, you know, that, that, that is not to be taken lightly. Um, so, Tom, if you go back a slide. Yeah. Um, so that, that one there, is, you know, it's got the, you basically highlighted the principles, you know, of authentic learning and 
how you've embedded them in this particular scenario to, uh, to help people learn. So this one is, is really important, I think. Um, have you- Yeah, and I can, I'll be happy to put the, uh, send you the link to these slides. It's a large slide deck. It's got videos embedded in it as well. But yeah, I'll send that and you can share that with everyone. Uh -huh. um, so just to finish up here, here you see all the various tools we used. Uh, students stored their work on Google Drive. We use WebEx. Web um, uh, we had our own uh, learning management system called Ipella that was developed in Turkey. Um, we had, uh, of course, Skype and Flipgrid and, and so forth. Um, and uh, technology really was a facilitator of the learning interactions, the learning uh, with rather than from. And uh, I'm really among of the many, many, many e-learning courses that on my video. So I'm going to skip that, but that's a wonderful video of learners from around the world talking about. And, and remember, these learners, these learners are physicians, they're pharmacists, they're public health inspectors, they're nurse practitioners, they're experts in their own uh, fields, uh, they're professionals in developing countries, but they all say, uh, and uh, it is a, one of the most gratifying videos, they all say, I never learned this way before. I didn't know that it was possible to learn this way before, because they were so used in their public health and medical education from being talked to from big uh, decks of, of slides, uh, uh, PowerPoint slides, uh, rather than being engaged in collaboration and doing authentic tasks and that sort of thing. I think yeah. I'm gonna ask you to go back to that slide with the student and show oh. a minute or two, because it, it came through so clear. The oh, did it? Okay. Good. Yeah, All right, let me, right. yeah, let me play a little bit of that. Many, play a minute or two or three. Many, many, many e-learning courses that on my been going through. I think Ipela is the best one in terms of true practical, and it is based on the real situation. The tasks were really challenging and real life application of the theory they learned. The resource persons were uh, available all the time. And I thoroughly enjoyed the fact that we had access to experienced mentors who were always available and shared uh, in an unrestrained and very cordial manner their huge wealth of experience in vaccines. I never felt that I was doing a course or online. It was rather like uh, doing a course, uh, a regular course with the uh, instructors, with the uh, resource persons uh, uh, near you. The whole technology and video and pictures make me feel uh, as like being in the place. The approach of working with people from different countries and sharing experience with each other uh, will help us to learn from each other. It was great to work with pro uh, professionals with similar interests from a whole diverse uh, list of countries. Uh, we still keep in touch, exchanging uh, professional um, experience. Um, the impact, uh, I believe, is that uh, the VVM now is uh, used in all the health centers, and they know the, the use of this VVM uh, in the vaccination process. Currently, I'm using the knowledge and skills obtained from the course to improve my capacities and capabilities of making decision, especially when I'm doing supportive supervision during the training and during monitoring and evaluation activities, including evaluation. So among of many, many uh, e-learning platform, I should advise a e learning course to be very best and very authentic. Go authentic. <laughs> that became our t-shirt, go authentic. I love it. <laughs> yeah, it was so gratifying to, to get those kinds of reactions from people uh, around uh, the world about the, uh, the course. So anyway, I, uh, Sarah McNeil probably is sick of seeing this because I've shown it several times that she's graciously invited me to the University of Houston on a number of occasions. Uh, and uh, so... Um, and she's seen that those slides uh, fairly frequently, but um, anyway, uh, yeah. So this, I think, this model of these critical uh, uh, de um, design principles for authentic learning really have legs. It can be used in lots and lots of 
of context. And I taught my evaluation course that way for 30 years. So I taught, uh, the course was originally called program evaluation, and then we switched it to instructional product evaluation and ended up being e-learning evaluation. But the way I taught that course for um, initially, of course, most of the time face-to-face, -face, but toward the end online. And when I had it online, I had learners from all over the world in the course. And um, this basically would split the class up into teams of three and uh, sometimes five, depends on how many students were in the course. And um, they were assigned to a real world client who had an, uh, an, an instructional product or an e-learning product that needed to be evaluated, evaluated. So they, during the 15, 16 week course, they would have to design uh, an evaluation uh, conduct the evaluation and report an evaluation. Those were the authentic tasks through which they learned. And uh, so um, I've used this approach for many, many years. And I think it's, frankly, I think it's the only way to go. I started off my career after I finished my PhD at uh, Syracuse in 79. I went to Peru for a year as a Fulbright lecturer. And um, then went to the Medical University of South Carolina. So I, my first job was as director of evaluation at the University of Medical University of South Carolina. I was only there about 15 months before I went to work for the army in uh, Europe for a year. But um, it opened me up to the challenges of medical education, public health education, nursing education, and so forth. And I've retained an interest of that in that ever since, and I'm still engaged in that sort of thing. Um, so um, I will tell one story though, how I got involved in this field. Some people may wonder, how do you, how do you get involved? You know, we all start off different things. There were two big influential events. One was when I was, I was in a Catholic seminary uh, from age uh, 13 to 17 in Pennsylvania and all boys, of course. <laughs> I don't know there are any co-ed seminaries <laughs> in the Catholic Church. <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, the priest there, the te or all the teachers were priests, and they somebody sent them a, a uh, kit for making overhead transparencies, and they didn't want to figure out how it works, so they somehow I got assigned to this, and I ended up just, and these were, you used ammonia bottles and you had all this developer and so forth. And uh, so I ended up making scores of overhead transparencies for the teachers there about, you know, Caesar's movements through the wars and all this kind of stuff. So that was the initial thing. And then after uh, I left the seminary, I uh, was drafted and I went into the army in the army, because I'd been in a seminary, made me a chaplain's assistant. Well, part of the uh, role of being a chaplain's assistant was you had to show character guidance films to soldiers every year. So the army sent me to an audiovisual training school in Fort Hamilton, New York. And so uh, I learned how to thread a 60 millimeter projector uh, while blindfolded uh, in nine point two seconds or something like that, it's crazy. Uh, so I got introduced to audiovisual education, both in the seminary and in the military. And then when I came out, went to undergraduate school, I decided I wanted to be a school teacher. So that's how I got started in this field. You know, if we, if we interviewed all the people in this room, in, in this virtual room, they probably have some stories like that, that they didn't intend to be in the field, but that's, they got their, some people are more directed uh, and have an undergraduate degree, a master's degree, and doctorate. And other people, it's after their degrees, they got entered into this field. But I have four questions for you. And I want to also open up to questions from the audience. But I, I, the, the people who came um, a couple of minutes ago, Chris Devers, hi, Chris, and Lynn Lynn from UNT. And the, uh, it's great to have you here. Tom was showing us a couple of examples of authentic learning and talking about them as well. Um, and what dawned on me or what entered my mind, hey, Chris. Hey, Kurt. Um, hey, John. Hey, Chris. Chris <clears throat> is from Johns Hopkins University, but lives in Indiana, I think, still up in Marion, Indiana. So, uh, so for those of you who are IU people, 
Um, Chris often is down in Bloomington and will meet you for dinner sometime. Uh, <laughs> with three little girls with me. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so time has to be a factor. Do you have people who've designed that particular scenario, uh, the Turkish one that you showed or the teaming one you showed? Did you have a team that designed them? Because for many people, adding authentic learning tasks become, becomes really daunting and, and it's something they'd like to do, but they decide maybe not to do or wait, uh, you know? So what can people, there's a two part question, answer that first part, but what can people do um, that don't have a lot of support that don't have a grant to get into the authentic learning space within their classes, within their projects and so forth? Yeah, well, the, the uh, World Health Organization course is an exception, obviously. That course took a lot uh, to develop. It was funded by the Gates Foundation and uh, other organizations and so forth. Uh, but it was so different from anything else the WHO was doing at the time. I mean, the, most of you probably at your universities have to take mandatory uh, uh, training about uh, online safety and all that kind of stuff. And it, I mean, if it's anything like what they have here at Georgia, it's terrible. <laughs> it's screen after screen after screen of information, but not really many authentic tasks. But um, so that, uh, that and most of the e-learning at WHO was like that. So this new course, which was, you know, authentic, built around authentic tasks, <clears throat> involved a lot of resources. But I think faculty uh, in just about any uh, uh, environment can come up with some authentic tasks in their course. Now, we argue in our book that you can build a whole course around authentic tasks. And uh, that, you know, is the strategy we recommend, but it, it, you don't have to do that. You can incorporate some authentic tasks. So I had a, another doctoral student who worked, uh, Hanam Abdo, who's at the University of San Francisco now. She um, worked with uh, a professor in geology here at Georgia for her dissertation, did a design-based research study and was trying to get geology students more engaged in the field of a geology. And so what, what, we, what she did in that case was they set up a, uh, like a, a, a simulated laboratory where students were given um, uh, fossils and, and uh, uh, rocks and things from the paleontological age uh, and they were, they, 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 again, they worked in teams to try to figure out, well, what is this thing? What, how do you uh, date it? Uh, all the other characteristics that you would do with geological samples. So the, with a major part of their course was actually classifying geological objects that no one had yet classified. So they were doing real work for the geology department and learning about geology by doing geology. And that's really the core of it, is whatever your field is, figure out well, what are the tasks that these people who know this stuff are eventually going to do, and then um, have them uh, work on those tasks in the course. So we can't all, thanks, Doug, we can't all hire actors and actresses for our authentic scenarios, but I'm reminded of the Jasper Woodbury project at Vanderbilt which is, a, uh, and people who are in my class, that's a reading for next week. So um, I, uh, from the Learning and Cognition Technology Group at Vanderbilt, what they did is hired actors and actresses after trying the concept out of creating a macro context for learning and using Raiders of the Lost Ark videos and Sherlock Holmes videos and other things to teach issues in physics, math, and reading comprehension and all sorts of things. And they end up getting a National Science Foundation grant to hire actors and actresses to act out scenarios where kids had to use their math, whether it was survey research around a high school uh, carnival dunk tank, or whether it was uh, figuring out gas mileage for a helicopter to go rescue a wounded uh, eagle or whatever. So that, 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 that's rich in, in fidelity. The second project I'm reminded of is Paul Kim's MOOC uh, called Designing a New Learning Environment, where he had 20-some thousand 
19, 20 some thousand enrollees around the world. And he got them to work in teams to solve a problem. And uh, that's in our first MOOCs book, Tom. Um, this one, so Tom and I have done two MOOCs books together, three, actually we've done three MOOCs books together. One, well, there was a special issue of the, that became a, a book, a special issue of the International Journal of E-Learning. Tom also helped me with this book on uh, a special path through e-learning in Asia back in 2008 or nine. And both him and Lin Lin recently helped me with this special issue of ETRND of which Lin Lin is the editor. Uh, they wrote a piece in here, which is free to access, just like Tom's authentic learning book is free and open. Um, someone, maybe Mena could find the link and put it in the chat window. Tom's article is the last Tom and Lin wrote the, the closing piece uh, related to the the, re the research that we're conducting is not necessarily what we want. And so um, it's, it's a fascinating article, an important article. And so I rec highly recommend it. The research we have is um, not the research we need. But anyways, Her, uh, uh, some people are in the chat are uh, indicating they have questions. So maybe we yep. need to open it up to questions. Yep. yep. So, um, so my point is, there's a difference in fidelity in authentic learning. Some are more high fidelity and some are more low fidelity. And the high fidelity ends up being very expensive and hard to replicate and take a lot of time. Are there low fidelity examples of authentic? I'll go to the questions here after this last one. Are there examples of low fidelity, authentic learning kinds of things uh, that people can utilize and rely upon to get people engaged in the activities? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I when I was a seventh grade social studies teacher, I, I wouldn't have known I was doing authentic learning, but I, my uh, fellow teachers and I, would, one of the big tasks every year was um, the students would uh, recreate a culture. So uh, one year it might be uh, uh, India, another year it might be uh, China, it might be Peru or whatever. And uh, so, you know, weeks and weeks were involved in setting up uh, different uh, representations of another culture so that they would come to understand culture as a construct. Uh, and uh, so, you know, that that was a, a low cost type of thing, but it was engaged a lot in time and so forth. But it really got the students doing hands-on type things. Other teachers were doing things like getting students to set up stores where, and, and have uh, you know sales and, and advertising and all these other types of things that would be involved in having a store. So yeah, I think I, I really do believe that so many instructors could, if they just were introduced to the idea of authentic learning, could build authentic tasks into their coursework. And for people who arrived late, uh, Tom showed a model of authentic learning. I just want to mention again, this special issue of etr and is on systemic reviews of the research uh, and meta-analyses. And Tom has an article, Mena, who's here, has a, has a piece in it. Um, the last one is a free, and it won an award or is nominated at no, it was selected as the best open access article of 2020. So I'm going to bring this with me to AECT. I have 100 copies signed by the editors and people who come up to me at AECT and say, I want a copy of the special issue, I will give you a copy. So um, if you go, um, uh, yeah. if you put in the chat window, let me know if you're going. Uh, so Chris, we should uh, jump into your question. Yeah, thanks so much, Tom, for being here. Um, my question was, um, what is the relationship, do you think, between background knowledge and authentic learning or tasks? Yeah, it's a great question, Chris. And, uh, you know, one of the uh, reactions we often get when we take um, this model to different departments is there's a pushback from usually from senior faculty saying, well, we can't engage them in authentic tasks until they've learned all the nomenclature and all the basic principles and so forth, then they can do authentic tasks. And our argument back is to say, no, well, not necessarily. You can start them doing the task and then as they need that new knowledge, you know, it's the whole idea in medical education. Some medical schools continue to have the first two years of medical school being students just uh, 
taking these courses in anatomy and physiology and so forth and memorizing all this stuff for tests and then not doing clinical work until their third and fourth years, hands-on with patients. Whereas others, uh, other medical schools uh, actually involve students in clinical work from the get-go and they learn the uh, uh, things about anatomy and physiology and so forth in the context of hands-on experience. Um, so I really, uh, I, I, you know, I think that um, the, I would argue that, you know, people don't need to learn all the stuff before they engage in, in doing stuff. Um, now, of course, medical education, you, <clears throat> you have risk involved and so forth. So you can't just, uh, you know, the first week in medical schools tell someone, we'll cut open this patient and take out their uh, <laughs> lungs or something. <laughs> you know? But uh, they can be involved in different ways, peripheral ways and so forth. So I hope that got answered your question, Chris. <clears throat> Yes, thank you. Yeah, so there was a question from uh, Dazi, Dazi up in up in Ottawa, yeah. who's who's working for the premier up in Ottawa, designing curriculum for the whole country of Canada and saving the world. So Dazi, and he studied community inquiry for his dis, for his doctorate up there. Um, so uh, Dazi. Well, uh, thank you, Todd. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Tom. Uh, I want to start by saying that I really felt in good company uh, because I went to minor seminary, Catholic minor seminary too, like Tom, from age yeah. 11 to 16. <laughs> yes. So, I, I, I so got, we could swap some stories. <laughs> absolutely. I got many inspiration from, from, from that place, but not for e-learning or learning or for this field. Okay, so... My question is about uh, a little bit is around semantic uh, is, uh, and some characteristic. We know that authentic learning is not only exclusive, it's not exclusive to in-person or face-to-face -face, uh, classroom or face-to-face -face context. But uh, you published a book in 2010 with uh, Jen Harrington and Ron Oliver about, uh, about uh, authentic e-learning as well. So my question to you is, oh, what are the main differences, the main characteristic and the difference in semantic between authentic e-learning and just in general authentic learning, which we know is not exclusive to in-person or face-to-face -face classes? Yeah, thank you for that question. It's um, it, absolutely, these uh, principles are, uh, applicable in just about any kind of environment, you know, face-to-face, -face, blended, online, and so forth. Uh, we, I don't remember how we came up with the title for that book, but uh, as we have used it, uh, we used it for years in workshops and so forth, and courses, and people would often say, well, why, why couldn't we just apply these ideas in a face-to-face -face context. And we say, yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I guess uh, the putting e-learning in the title uh, made it a, maybe a little more marketable for Rutledge and so forth, but it could have just been uh, authentic learning, period. Uh, a guide to authentic learning. It not necessarily limited to, to online or, bl or blended or, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the courses you probably remember the most as kids probably involve some sort of authentic task. Um, and uh, so when you got to do real things and uh, I, I just uh, can't uh, promote enough this whole idea of learning through authentic task, you know. And when I work with designers in whether it's face-to-face -face or blended or online, totally, uh, I always say, what's the task? What are students going to do? Well, first, what are they gonna learn? What are the, what's the knowledge, the skills, the attitudes, the uh, cognitive drives that they're gonna come out of your course with? And then in order to accomplish those objectives, 
what is it they're going to do? If you're going to tell me, well, they're just going to read a whole bunch of chapters and they're going to write a paper and they're going to take a multiple choice exam, then there's a mis often a, 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 a misalignment, a lack of alignment between what you say your goals are and how you're going to organize their learning experiences and assess their knowledge. There's an, a, a misalignment there. And so a way of aligning that is building everything around authentic learning tasks. So our next question, let's go ahead, Dodds, do you have a comment? Oh, no, I, I just want to thank, uh, to, to thank Tom for, for the response. I really appreciate it. Thank you. So Therese has a long question. Maybe it might be a couple of them. Therese? Yep, thank you so much, Dr. Reeves, for bringing up the whole aspect of medical education because that's my context right now. I sit, I sit at a medical university and this semester we're offering our courses in a high flex model. So we have students who are face-to-face, -face, we have students who are online. And, you know, technology can really support that whole authentic part of it for things like when they go into anatomy lab, and physiology and all of the biology courses. I, I see the potential for technology really making a difference to learning in an active fashion where the face-to-face -face students can do that in the lab. How do we now cater for the online students is the question that keeps coming up for everybody, um, especially since some of these, these apps and technology could be very costly and also their bandwidth intensive. And if we have people all over the world, how could we make this more inclusive to them when you have two different audiences happening at the same time? Any suggestions on that? Yeah, uh, I would uh, probably uh, need to know more about the context, but yeah, that is always a challenge. And this high flex model <clears throat> is being used quite a bit these days. I know one thing for sure. I remember years ago, my late uh, uh, colleague, Mike Hannafin, uh, who's just such a great scholar, uh, passed away a few years ago. His son was in medical school. Uh, I won't mention which one, but uh, I remember Mike telling me that his son never went to classes because uh, the lectures he didn't learn from the lecture. So what he did instead was he formed study groups with other like-minded students and they would just cram for the exams in these study groups and not even go to lectures. And I saw that, uh, I spoke at a, a very well-known medical university in another state um, a couple of falls ago. And uh, there again, I went to the lecture halls and there might've been a third of the students in the first and second year were in those lecture halls because they had realized that, well, they're recording the lectures and it's gonna be much more, a better use of my time just to meet in study groups and scan through these lectures, but just really cram for the exams and so forth. So if that's your pedagogy, then you're gonna get those kinds of students' reactions. I mean, they're gonna, they know that they can win the game, which is uh, getting an A, I guess, uh, by using their own approach and so forth. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't give a more uh, uh, exact answer to that, but I, I'm happy if you wanna send me some questions uh, through email and uh, treeves at uga.edu and uh, can maybe provide a little more access to some information to help with that. I'll put Great, your email you. in. Thank you, Therese. I'll put your email in the chat, Tom. And um, Sharonica's got a comment and then uh, Nelson has a question. So Sharonica first from Sri Lanka. Oh, all right. Okay, thanks, uh, Kurt. Actually, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, great to see Tom again. Uh, you did a fantastic uh, presentation for our Open University staff as well. And I just wanted to just share uh, what we've been doing about these uh, scenarios uh, you mentioned about, because uh, we have a full full program, a master's program where all the courses are uh, based on scenarios, uh, authentic scenarios, and all the tasks, because we are 
in teach education, I mean, I'm from the faculty of education. So in teach education, it's, I think it's easy to create these authentic scenarios because uh, they are in the you know, field. So all the tasks are around uh, and it's quite interesting, but still it's sometimes they find it, uh, the workload is, you know, uh, well, it's not just doing the work, but reflecting on it, writing on it, evaluating the task. So it's a this whole design and, uh, you know, the whole process is, um, well, I would say it's interesting, but it's challenging as well. Uh, uh, still, it's about at the end of the process, they all realize how, how productive and how meaningful it has been and how they have developed at the end of the thing, their reflections show through this authentic uh, scenarios, they have developed a lot. So I just wanted to share uh, our experience and thank you so much. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, participating in the session. Well, thank you. It's so good to see you again. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, it's interesting. I remember years ago, I was doing a keynote in Australia with uh, Jan Harrington and uh, we were describing some, uh, she was teaching uh, online, people had to design online courses. And so again, use the authentic task. Uh, students actually had to work for real clients uh, and often at a distance to help them design online learning. So they played the role of instructional designers uh, to help people develop online courses. And um, we gave the keynote. And I remember a woman came up to me at the end and said, well, you know, I was in Jan Harrington's course and I, that was the most work I've ever done in my life. Oh my gosh, it was, I had to work on weekends. I had to work late at night. And, and, uh, and I, was, I was thinking, oh my gosh, she's really upset. And then she took a breath and she said, why aren't all my courses this way? Why aren't all my courses this, uh, you know, authentic and engaging and so forth? So she, she really wasn't complaining. She was, you know, she was noting that it is the more demanding, it is more work, uh, but she also really valued that experience. So thank you, Sharonika. What time is it there where you are? Not that late, it's uh, like 7.30 p.m. Oh, okay, not too bad, okay. <laughs> yeah, not too bad. <laughs> so Sharonika has done a couple of um, books or reports for the the um, Commonwealth of Learning on Integrating OER in Educational Practice. Uh, this one's on practitioner stories. Uh, there's, a, there's a new one, I can't find on my shelf, so it's running over to, to quickly. Uh, Sharonika, do you have uh, a copy of the new one and you might want to promote it because it's free for people to oh, download? I think, yeah, with the screen, you can see it, I think. Can yeah. you see? No, because you have- it, Oh, the virtual thing. Yeah. Uh, all right, I'll remove it. Can you put a link in the, in the chat? Oh, so, okay, I'll, I'll put the link, I'll put the link. Um, actually, now we, we created a um, set of MOOCs. In the MOOCs, uh, they were also with this uh, scenario-based learning. And actually, uh, you talked about these videos. Uh, actually, uh, in all of, we also created scenario-based videos as a new concept. Uh, in the videos, we didn't get, uh, you know, real actors or the whole, the course team members, the lecturers, they, they acted. Mm -hmm. You know, our, <laughs> they acted, I can uh, share, I mean, I can put in the chat box the links if you would like to watch. They are all OER, they are released in, with Creative Commons licenses. Great, that's yes, please, please put both the, the new book I'll and put the links to the videos. And if you, if you came in a little late, Tom's book on authentic e-learning is now a, a free PDF for anyone. So you can download the entire book. Um, so if you came to hear about authentic learning, you can read about it after, the, after this is over. Um, Nelson has a question for you, Tom. We, we only have a few minutes left, but I um, wanna get in a couple more. Nelson. Yes. Um... I wanted to ask, because you mentioned that you have done work that involved helping create a math test for a student who could not attend class. And I wanted to ask, what was your process like designing alternative options for assessments? And what are some guidelines or scholarly articles that help you design effective alternatives to assessment while still retaining their authentic qualities? 
Yeah, thank you, Nelson. Uh, actually, that work was originally done by Jen Harrington as part of her doctoral research. Uh, and uh, her husband, Tony Harrington, who's also a dear friend of mine, uh, he was in math education in Western Australia. And they came up with, uh, gosh, I think it was 30 or 35 different ways to assess knowledge <clears throat> in medical education, uh, excuse me, in mathematics education, uh, or as they call it, maths. Um, and uh, they, uh, so these different ways were uh, provided uh, in this CD-ROM, uh, unfortunately, is, I don't think it's available anymore, but uh, she's also developed some wonderful resources. I'll try to, uh, uh, there's a link she has. I don't I hope it's still active. Uh, let me just quickly look here. But um, the uh, she and Tony went on to write a, a book about authentic assessment. Uh, and, uh, and that's referenced in there as well. But uh, yeah, because most times uh, folks, um, uh, you know, unfortunately, um, will uh, just use paper and pencil tests for math. And whereas there are other ways to do that for sure. Um, huh. I'm trying, it's um, I'm not, not jumping up at me now, but I'll try to get that link to her webpage on authentic learning. She's retired now and uh, may not be doing as much with that or now. Um, she's enjoying life. <laughs> but, well, we have uh, a, couple, a, couple, a couple minutes left. I want to make sure someone who didn't ask a question gets a chance to ask the question. Um, so anyone want to jump in? And, and also, if Sarah would like to make a comment for the record here about authentic learning. You've heard Tom many times. Would you like to uh, jump in here and, and make a comment or a question? Oh, you're out with your horses. You're muted, Sarah. You have to unmute. I have a co-presenter this morning, a co-listener <laughs> this morning. This is Lena. Oh, wow. I don't know if I can get far enough back. Anyway, um, I want to put on the record, I'm going to turn my video off because it'll make you seasick, that... Uh, I would never in a million years get tired of listening to Tom Reeves. <laughs> I, could, I could listen to him every morning as a daily inspiration. And maybe that's what I need to do. <laughs> um, but, but one thing that we've done, I guess over the past 20 years is we actually do incorporate authentic learning in our courses here at the University of Houston. Our first MOOCs that we designed were actually designed by students working in teams. And we did it on a zero budget, <laughs> which was pretty impressive, I think. And uh, the first one, Digital Storytelling, Powerful Tools for Teaching and Technology, uh, has almost 50,000 learners right now today. So I'm pretty proud of it. But students designed those MOOCs in teams and uh, I think they learned a lot, but it was a big risk for us because we had never designed a MOOC. And so we told them, you know, we want to do this, but we don't know anything about it. We're going to learn together. And that's how we've tackled all of the uh, authentic learning tasks that we've done, I guess, since 2000, designing uh, web pages, websites for the Museum of Fine Arts Houston and our Blaffer Student Art Gallery here on campus and PBS, our PBS station here in Houston. So Tom has really inspired us in his work with authentic learning and all of that. And you can find their chapter you, in, in the MOOCs book that Tom and I edited uh, back in 2015. They have a chapter on what Sarah's just talking about. I'm happy to share that with anyone if you'd like to read about what's at, what happened in Houston with digital storytelling. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a huge number of, of, of population that you're working with. Big data, big data as they call it. 
Well, thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Kurt. It's an excellent piece, and I'm really glad that you got in that book. Um, so, uh, Lynn, do you want to have a final comment? The editor now of ETRND that uh, I've talked about the special issue. Would you like to talk about uh, authentic learning or anything you heard here today? Well, uh, well, thank you so much for having me here. I, I you know, I admire uh, Tom's work, and it was so much fun writing that piece with Tom. And uh, you know, he he just speaks what he, um, you know, I, I was a concerned, you know, whether we should sort of be more mild, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he, he speaks the truth. And uh, so I really enjoyed working with him. And, you know, I, I know we are already out of time, but I, I, you know, the authentic learning is something I'm myself, I, you know, try to um, incorporate. Uh, it, it's not easy. It's easy. It's easy to say, right? But in the system we have, you know, with the courses that are set up, that are supposed to be certain ways, and also the K twelve setting with all the subject areas, you know, I've been for looking at math specifically as well. Uh, you know, the the skills. I think someone, uh, Chris, or someone asked the question before the authentic quality compared to authentic learning, they're not the same thing. So, so yeah, thank you so much for having me here. I just, uh, I'm thinking and uh, learning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Lynn. And Lynn's at uh, the University of North Texas, which has an excellent program. If, if I was going to list the top five programs in our field today, I would certainly have uh, UNT in that list. So it's a great program of great faculty there. I got to do a, a review there a few years ago and just so impressed. And we have amazing faculty members here. Dr. Yeah. Dr. Spector, Dr. Kishuk, Kathy Norris, uh, Gerald Kalesic. I mean, they are all very impressive scholars. And Lynn Lynn. <laughs> Thank you. And Yoon Joanne, the chair, who's an alum of the IST program, we cannot forget her at Indiana University. So, yeah. And yeah. Scott Warren, also from Indiana University. Another one, a couple of Indiana people. So, Yoon Jo, Lin Lin, and I, and Maina Ju did a study of gamification of MOOCs that came out this year. So, uh, we had, it was great to work together. Well, I want to thank everyone for coming in today. Um, and, and joining us. And we had a chance to hear what's happening, not just at, you know, with Tom's work at Georgia, we have Johns Hopkins in Houston and uh, in Open U of, Sh of uh, Sri Lanka and the University of North Texas. So my students who attended this got to hear multiple perspectives uh, and that's great. So they, they, you know, they're not getting necessarily one view on authentic learning. They can see that many people have explored it and are facing similar issues about it and continue to do it despite the difficulties involved in setting it up or conceptualizing it. Um, and so I think your slides might uh, go a long ways with helping other people now operationalize this. And again, the book is free now. The um, authentic e-learning is now, there's a link at the top that we posted to download the entire book. So, um, so please take a look at that. And um, my students will be reading from Tom again next week. They'll be um, uh, in terms of learning theories comparison, Tom. Uh, before we go, can you tell us if you have one favorite theory that, uh, and how is that captured in the piece that they're gonna read? Yeah, well, I wrote that uh, chapter with uh, Trisha, my wife, who's a professor emeritus of social work here at the University of Georgia. And uh, she has cleaned her office out, so she doesn't have that task. Uh, I'm, I, uh, earlier, for those of you who came late, I mentioned I have to clean out my office at UGA after 39 years. So uh, I'm gonna burn up several shredders, I suspect. And, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, yeah, if, I, if uh, learning by doing uh, is uh, been the core of, of what I promote in terms of learning theories. Uh, there's so many uh, people who promoted that in different uh, ways over the decades and so forth. Uh, so, you know, uh, as, so I would contrast learning by telling versus learning by doing, <laughs> you know, uh, 
too much of our teaching and learning is still uh, trying to promote learning by telling people or having them read, just read and so forth, not enough by having them do so. Uh, and I could get into some really big arguments with uh, some other folks in the field about that, but uh, at, the at the core, I'm a constructivist, uh, a constructionist uh, in terms of Seymour Papert's ideas, where you have to create an artifact that represents or represents your knowledge and that can be shared and critiqued and revised over time. That to me is absolutely uh, good pedagogy. And Raj, you want to just say hi coming off a of camera? I, I know you sent me a little note on the side here. Maybe you have kids on your lap. I don't know. All right. Um, Hello, Dr. Bond. I'll just join. Did you have a final comment, Raj? Thank you so much, Dr. Reeves. It was always wonderful uh, to attend your sessions. I learned a lot. And I really want to thank you for this. And I look forward for the slides. Are you okay. on an exercise well, machine? You. I'm sorry, Dr. Bob. Are you on an exercise machine? <laughs> no, I'm just chanting because uh, <laughs> my background is bad. My kids are around, so <laughs> I'm sorry for that. No, no worries. Uh, I normally would have a couple of dogs in here, but uh, they're uh, sleeping off breakfast right now. So. Uh, that sometimes they uh, get involved in my uh, presentations uh, by barking. So, <laughs> well, I'm just dissertating right now. So, uh, okay. Uh, well, congratulations. Uh, just remember the only good dissertation is a done dissertation. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, I want to thank everyone again. Thank Tom for coming. Uh, he's been a repeat. Per I don't normally bring people back, but as everyone's uh, the testimonies have come in, he's, he's a really great guest to have. He's done such a range of work that, that applies to the introduction of uh, EdTech Foundations class. Uh, so you'll see his name a lot in the readings. No matter what class you read in this field, you'll see Tom reads his name and his wife, Trisha in the uh, next week as well. So we have a special double dual uh, Reeves and Reeves. Uh, and so I, again, if we give a round of applause to Tom and and uh, you can put anything you want in the chat to thank him. Uh, I am gonna stop this recording at this point and just point out in 15 minutes, I'll be back with my students who wanna attend. I'll be talking about cognitive theory. I'll be telling them as opposed to doing it. Uh, sorry to, to Tom, um, so stop.